Someone once said, missions is not the ministry of choice for a few hyperactive Christians in the church. Missions is the purpose of the church. It's not just that God says, okay, you know what? I want a couple of people to do missions in the church. That's not God's intentions for the church. God's intention is that the church as a whole would be involved in the missions program, in the missions, uh, whatever you would like to call it, but in the mission of going and giving the gospel and reaching others for the cause of Christ. Oswald J. Smith said this, Any church that is not seriously involved in helping fulfill the Great Commission has forfeited its biblical right to exist. If you're not involved in the Great Commission, going, we talked about this the other week, what is that? It's going, it's preaching and teaching the gospel, it's baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and it's discipling people, teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That is all part of fulfilling the Great Commission. David Platt says this, Somewhere along the way we've subtly and tragically taken the costly command of Christ to go, baptize, and teach all nations and mutated it into a comfortable call for Christians to come, be baptized, and listen in one location. It is important for us to get together as a church. It is important to have a gathering together of God's people. The Bible speaks of that. But that is not all that the church was called to be and not all that the church is called to do. We are called to go and to be a part of giving the gospel to the ends of the earth. And someone said, unless we go out, even the unreached on the next block will never be reached. You know, as a church, we can talk about missions and we can talk about reaching people, but if we're not going out and involved in doing that, even the people next door to us in our neighborhoods are still unreached people if we're not going out and reaching them as a church. We saw a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the church at Antioch and we were talking about the character traits of a missions-minded church. What are things that we see in God's Word from a church that was very missions-minded, from a church who, who very obediently carried out the mission of Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature? Of Mark 16, 15, to do that. Of Acts 1, 8, that where Jesus said, Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We see that exemplified in the church at Antioch. So what are some of the characteristics of of that church. What are its character traits? We saw uh, before that it was a church that gave the gospel to those that were around them. It didn't matter who it was. They were out there going and giving the gospel and reaching people. We saw they were a church that spent a lot of time in God's Word discipling others. That's something important that a church would disciple its young believers and older believers alike. We saw that they lived like Christ. The Bible tells us it was that Antioch that they were first called Christians. They were supposed to be a derogatory term. Oh, you little Christians, you little Christ-like people. And instead it caught on a little bit and uh, still being used. Uh, but that's where they lived like Christ. They were generous in their giving. We saw that, that when there was a need to give, uh, they gave and they helped to reach others for the cause of Christ through their giving. I believe that it was these character traits, along with some of the ones that we're going to look at tonight, that made the Antioch church the obedient church when it came to being a missions-minded church. And certainly while we don't look at Scripture and while we don't, like the Bible says, compare ourselves among ourselves, we go, oh, we want to be like that. No, we're supposed to be like Christ. But I believe there are some character traits here that we can say that has the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ attached to it. And we're going to see that this evening. I think we should endeavor to be a church that would be missions-minded, much like this church here at Antioch. Go with me. You're in Acts chapter number 13. I want you to begin reading with me. We're going to read a few verses here that's going to speak to the character traits of this missions-minded church. Verse number 1, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. 
As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They had also John to their minister. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to look at a few examples here of some character traits of a missions-minded church. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together here this evening to sing some songs together, to help to lift one another up, encourage one another in the Word of God. I pray that you be with me right now as I preach this message this evening, Father. I pray that you would use it in our hearts and our lives. May we see the character traits of a missions-minded church. May we endeavor here at Coastal Baptist Church, may we endeavor to be a church that fulfills the call of the Great Commission. Lord, as, as a church, as individuals who make up this church, I pray that every person would commit themselves to being a missions-minded believer, for that is what you've called us to be. Be with me now, I do pray. Fill me with your Spirit's power. Give me strength this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to go with me and look here, uh, beginning back at verse number 1 and verse number 2. There's a list of these men, of these teachers, of these prophets that are there at the church at Antioch. Uh, the Bible has been talking um, primarily through the first several chapters of the book of Acts about the church at Jerusalem. One of the things that we see that's different, though, about the church at Jerusalem and the church that is at Antioch the church at Jerusalem had a great ministry. I mean, there's no denying what the Lord did there. We see the gospel was preached on the day of Pentecost. Peter preaches. There are 3,000 people that get saved on the day of Pentecost. Just a little time later, the Bible tells us there are 5,000 men that get saved when a message is preached. There is all kinds of people getting saved but one of the things that you see about the church of Jerusalem is that it primarily stays in Jerusalem. It does not continue to spread out and to move out. Eventually, the Lord says, okay, if you're not going to go, I'll make you go. And He brings persecution upon them, and it's only after the persecution that they begin to spread and to go out. Christ gave the command to go. He gave that there in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. I don't believe it was something the Lord was saying, okay, one of these days I want you to go and do these things. I think it was something He wanted them to do right then and there. But the church at Jerusalem, they stayed within Jerusalem. God blessed and they were growing and seeing people saved, but ultimately God brought persecution and allowed persecution to come upon that church so that they would branch out and go out. Some of the people after the persecution and the stoning of Stephen, the Bible says that they, that they begin to spread out and some of them went teaching the gospel and they went as far as Antioch and sure enough the Lord was working there and then God uses the church at Antioch to be the first really missions church. They didn't just keep their little group there at Antioch. The Lord was working in a mighty way. The Bible tells us that there were lots of people getting saved. If you were to lurk at, lurk, not lurk at the church, but look at the church, if you were to look at the church at Antioch and you would have been there, you would have seen a church that was growing, a church that by all means that we will look at today, that if you were putting a check mark by a successful church, you could have put it there. I mean, people growing in the faith, people learning the Word of God, people getting saved, ministries growing. I mean, things that were going on there, it, you would have put a mark by and said, great church, but they didn't stop there. They fulfill Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8 to go out to all the world and to preach the gospel. Not just in their Jerusalem, but in their Judea, in their Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Paul makes three missionary journeys out of that church. And you can go and look where he went. And he literally travels all over the known world and, and the areas that are there. And, and disciples go out of that church to go and to start other churches and to see people saved and to fulfill that call of the Great Commission. So what are some of the character traits here beginning in verse 1 and 2, we see these men that are, that are prophets and teachers here. This church, this list that's given. And I want you to see, first of all, verse number 2, as they minister to the Lord. This was a serving church. It was a serving church. 
It was a group of people who were called together and who had come together to serve the Lord and to work for Him and to minister to Him. Notice that it doesn't say, as they ministered to Saul. It doesn't say, as they ministered to one another. Now, it, don't misunderstand me. It's fine to minister to one another, and it's fine to minister to each other in the sense of the word of helping one another and encouraging one another and doing for one another. That's fine. But this was not a church that served just one another in the sense of that they ultimately, they served the Lord. They knew and they had the right focus, and their focus was on the Lord. And the fact that their focus was on the Lord and their focus was on God, their focus was on serving Him, it it led to them being a church that obeyed the Lord and went out and did what the Lord told them to do. In a minute when we see that they're going to follow the Holy Spirit, they're doing that because they were focused on serving the Lord and serving God with their life. I like what Jim Elliott once said. He said, it's hard to steer a parked car. You ever just sat there in your car before and tried to turn your steering wheel? It doesn't work so well, does it? But get out here on the road and start going 35, 40, 50 miles an hour. It's easy just to do this right here, isn't it? It's easy to move over and to turn that wheel and to turn and to guide and to lead that car. It's a lot harder when you're going just dit, 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 a lot harder to try to turn that wheel and go and do so the same is true in our lives. When we're focused on serving the Lord, when we're focused as a church on following Him, when we're focused on serving God as a unified body of believers, it's easy for God just to go, okay, here church, here's what I want you to do. When everybody's serving Him and focused on Him, and people don't have, well, we've got our own agenda here, and we're going to do what we want to do over here, and we're going to do this here. No, 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 no. When we're serving and ministering to the Lord, when we're following after Him, God just says, okay, here, church, this is what I want you to do. And that's what we see here at the church at Antioch. They were a serving church. Notice this, they were a seeking church as well. Multiple times here, just within a couple of verses, the Bible uses the words fasted and prayed. Verse number two says that they fasted. Verse number three says when they had fasted and prayed. They were a seeking church. This wasn't on a whim that they said, hey, you know what? Let's just, uh, okay, Barnabas saw, okay, get out of here. Let Y'all go do something for Jesus, okay? I'm all for people doing something for Jesus, okay? I'm all for people serving the Lord. I'm all for people going to the mission field. I'm all for people being called to the, to the ministry. But this church was a seeking church. They weren't just deciding on a whim, okay, this is what we're going to do. Okay, this is the direction that we're going. Okay, this is the change that we're going to make. No, no, no. It, they were a church that were, they were praying. They were fasting. You know how to tell when we're serious about something? fast. That's when we're serious. <laughs> That's when we want to hear from God. That's when we're looking for an answer. When, when we are willing to say, you know what, I'll give up a meal. You know what, I'll give up food for the day. You know what, I am going to not eat and rather spend time in prayer. That was what this church was doing. They're fasting and they're praying because they are seeking an answer from the Lord. And when we get to the point where, where we're like this church, where we're fasting and praying to the Lord, we can know that we're truly seeking the Lord's will. We can know that we are seeking what God wants. They weren't just like, okay, all right, we're going to be the church. Nobody else is doing it. We'll be the church to go out and do this. No, the Bible doesn't tell us that that was their mindset at all. Their mindset was, we are serving the Lord. Now, what does God want us to do? We are going to seek Him. We're going to fast. We are going to pray. What is it that the Lord desires of us? They were a seeking church. Arthur T. Pearson said, Every step in the progress of missions is directly traceable to prayer. We're not, when we're talking about some of what we want to do with missions and some of the direction that we want to go, we're not just saying, hey, let's just, let's just do this and let's just do this. No, we want, to, we want to be a matter of prayer. We want to be something that is prayed about. We want something that we are seeking the Lord on and that He is leading and guiding and directing in. This goes right along with it, I believe, the second thing here. As a seeking church, they were a serving church, they were a seeking church, but notice this as well, they were a spirit-led church. 
As they prayed, as they were fasting, the Bible says in verse number 2 that the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Now, as a church, they are serving the Lord. They're ministering to the Lord. They're serving Him. They are a unified body of believers that's doing what the Lord has called them to do. As that unified body of believers that is serving the Lord and seeking His face, the Holy Spirit then says, here's what I want you to do. And the Bible says that they do it. They do it. He says, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work whereunto I have called them. So they separate Paul and Barnabas and they begin to pray and fast for Paul and Barnabas even more so then. Why? Because they are a spirit-led church. When God spoke, when the Holy Spirit of God said, do this, that's what they did. You know, I believe that a church can be a spirit-led church and that the Spirit of God can move and work in a church to direct them to what He desires for them to do. You say, well, well, there's so many different people in the church, though, and we've got people here and here and here and here, and we've got this idea and that idea and that and that and that. But when it comes to serving the Lord, when everybody's focused on serving the Lord, and it's a unified body of believers, and we're seeking and praying, I believe that the Holy Spirit of God leads and guides and directs just the same as He could back then and the same as He did back then. A problem, I believe, is that oftentimes individually in our lives and perhaps corporately as churches as well, we have taken the Holy Spirit of God and removed Him out of the equation. We have taken the Spirit of God and we've said, you know what, we can, get, we can do this. We, we've, got, we've got our committees and we've got our thoughts and we've got all the engineering and we've got everything worked out already. We've already got everything put in place and in order. It was C.T. Studd years ago that said how little chance the Holy Ghost has nowadays. The churches and missionary societies have so bound him in red tape that they practically ask him to sit in a corner while they do the work themselves. May it never be said of us that the Holy Spirit is not involved in the decisions and in the steps that we take as a church. May we never say that what we do is, has not already been bathed in prayer and, and we have allowed the Holy Spirit of God to work through the leadership in the church and through those that would come together to make decisions and then the church as a whole, that, that things would not be done in a manner in which we are doing it following the Holy Spirit of God. One of the character traits of this missions-minded church is that they were following and being led by the Spirit of God. As a matter of fact, later on, you see the missionaries out on the field. They were Spirit-led as well. Remember what the Bible says? They were going to go over into Asia, and the Spirit says, no, they're going to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit does not allow them to do that. And then they get the Macedonian cry saying, come and help us. And they're like, oh, that's the direction that we're supposed to go. And they follow the Holy Spirit, and they allow Him to lead in their life. By the way, it's important as an individual to yield to the Holy Spirit in your life, to listen to the Holy Spirit, to follow the Holy Spirit. You have to test the Spirit, the Bible says. You know, test the Spirit, see whether it be of God or not. The Holy Spirit of God's never going to lead you contrary to the Word of God. He's never going to lead you contrary to what uh, and what would be against the, the Word and against Scripture. But the Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God, as a believer, that Jesus said to His disciples, He will lead you and guide you into all all truth. And he said, thy word is truth. The Holy Spirit, along with the word of God, is what we have to lead and guide and direct us as believers. And so here we see a character trait of the church being that it was a spirit-led church. The Holy Ghost says, and that's what they did. Then notice this, they were a sending church. They were a sending church. Here we have in verse number three, when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, they sent them away. When they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Say, so what does that mean? It means that they prayed, they followed the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, to the, for the work that I've called them to. They come together, they pray and fast some more, they pray and they lay their hands on Paul and Barnabas. They say, you know, we're, we're with you, we're praying for you, now we're going to send you away. You say, what's the importance of being a sending church? Someone once wrote and said this, the mark of a great church is not its seating capacity, but its sending capacity. Here's what we oftentimes have the tendency to do. 
What would you do if we had a Paul and Barnabas that came in tonight? What is your first and your initial thought and your reaction? Paul and Barnabas! I mean, now, Paul, and, Paul was still referred to as Saul at this point in time, and Barnabas, I mean, they were great teachers and leaders in church. Saul wasn't the man that, that we get to look back and know him as, as Paul the Apostle, and he hadn't done everything he had done, but he was an up-and-comer, so to speak. I mean, God, had, God was using him in a mighty way. God had already used Barnabas in a mighty way. We have a tendency to say, oh, you know, there's the hard worker. There's the, the ones that God is using. Let's keep them here. You know, let's make sure they stay close to home. Let's make sure they don't go anywhere. Let's make sure that they stay. And yet God is always, and I believe, is calling people to go. And sometimes, whether it be as parents or as grandparents or as pastors or as whoever it may be, we have a tendency to go, oh, no, 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 those are the best ones. Let's let them stay here, God. Don't take them away. They're really serving you. Don't take them away. They're really giving. Don't take them away. They're really working and wanting to bring honor and glory to you. Don't take them away. They're a great soul winner. Don't take them away. They're a great discipler. We have a tendency to want to say, stay, stay, stay. When really God says, go, go, go. God says, I want you to go. God says, I want your young people to go. God says, I want you to go. I'm not trying to get rid of anybody that God wants to keep here, okay? I'm not complaining if you stay and serve the Lord right here. But we have a responsibility to allow the Holy Spirit of God to work and to move. And if God calls our children, we ought to be willing to let our children go. I might have to swallow those words one day, but I hope I'll be willing that if God calls my child, He calls them to a foreign field, that I'll say, God, they can better serve you there and do more there for you than they're here if they're close to me. That's where you want them to be. I want them to go. It's what we ought to be willing to do with our children, with our grandchildren, with those that are living for God and those that are serving God. As Paul and Barnabas were, we ought to be willing to say, okay, we're going to send you. We're going to push you out. We're going to put our hands on you and pray for you and go because that's what God's called you to do. They were a sending church. I, I remember hearing Dr. David Gibbs one time tell the story and tell the account of he was at a church and he was preaching there and uh, after he had preached one night, he was sitting next to the pastor and he said there was uh, kind of a commotion and kind of a stir that began to uh, happen there after the invitation was given and uh, said a younger, younger gentleman had come forward and uh, said he was at the altar and said he was praying and, and said there was a couple, of, uh, a couple of the deacons that had... Uh, come up and then they came up and after praying they came up and talked to the pastor and uh, the pastor's sitting there talking to to them and then talking over to Brother David Gibbs and there's this whole scene that's kind of going on there and and uh, Brother Gibbs just asked you know said what's you know what's going on right now what you know kind of what's happening and and uh, the uh, the pastor told him he said that the the gentleman that's there uh, right there is is a young man who has been to medical school and and he th- he went through this whole thing of all the years that he'd gone to get his doctorate he was a specialized surgeon only one of so many uh, you know in the United States I mean just a uh, you know had just started off this career that would that would be a magnificent career for anyone. And he had come forward that night and he had told the Lord that he was surrendering to missions and to go to the mission field. And the deacons and different ones were trying to talk him out of it, trying to tell him, you've just spent, you know, 10, 12 years, whatever it's been uh, to, for this specialized medicine. You're one of very few people in the, in the United States that can do this. You're what, what, you, know, you can't go and leave. This is what God has you here. This is what God wants you right now. And, 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 and Dr. David Gibbs says something to the effect of, you know, don't you try to talk him out of that. Don't you try to talk him out of the calling of the Lord, you know, on his life. You know, but oftentimes that's what, that's what churches or, or, or parents or family has a tendency to do. Instead of saying, uh, go, 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 we say, no, stay, stay, stay. 
can't tell you how many stories you, I've read of, of men like William Carey and Adoniram Judson and those that we look back now as, as heroes of the faith who really of themselves said, we didn't do anything, we served a mighty God, but how many times they were told, you, you can't go, you can't do that, you, you shouldn't do that, there's no way to do that, and they just plodded along and they just kept on saying, I'm going to go, we're going to go, we're going to go. We ought to be a sending church. That's one of the characteristics of this church here at Antioch. They were a sending church. They were willing to let the best of them, so to speak, go and serve the Lord on the mission field. And then notice this. They were a supportive church. Uh, the Bible says there, verse number 13, that they laid their hands on them, that they prayed for them, that they send them away. And then I want you to skip forward to me to, to chapter number 14. And towards the end of the chapter, this is already given the whole first missionary of Paul. He's gone from Derby and Lystra, and he's gone to Iconium, and he's gone to uh, Antioch, Pisidia, and he's gone to Perga. And uh, he's made his way through all those cities, and he's made his way all the way back. And now he's coming back to the church at Antioch to give a report. And I want you to notice what happens. It says, and, and thence, verse number 26, thence sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. That, 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 that was a supporting church. The church had recommended them. They, the Lord had uh, brought them before the church and the church had prayed for them. And it says that they fulfilled the work which they've been called to do. Verse 27, and when they were come... And notice these next few words, and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how He had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. So here's this church at Antioch who has sent them away. They've recommended them to the grace of God to go forth, to do the work. They've fulfilled the work. They've come back. They're telling them about it. They've gathered together the whole church to listen and to hear about what God has done. Then the Bible says that they abode. They stayed there a long time with the disciples. And you say, well, how do you know they are a supporting church? They send them away. They pray for them. They bring them back. They're listening to how the trip went. They're listening to what God's been doing over all this last month. And they've They've heard of all that the Lord is doing, and then they're going to send them back out again two more times. Paul is going to go back out from this church at Antioch. Three different separate missionary journeys he's going to take. He never makes it back from the third one, we don't believe, uh, but, and we believe that's how it happened and how it took place there. But they were a supportive church. They were a church that said, we're going to pray for you. We're going to send you out. We're going to be here when you get back. We're going to support you and listen to what God's been doing. We're going to let you come and, and come back. And when you're off the field, we're going to fellowship with you. We're going to grow with you in the Lord. We're going to send you back at the right time. And they continue to do that process. And they continue to send others out to go out into the world uh, to reach the world for the cause of Christ. William Carey, when he was getting ready to first go over to India, and uh, he was talking with the missions group back at home, and, and, and he explained to them that going over to India was like going into a deep, unexplored mine. And he said, but here's the thing. He said, I will go down if you will hold the rope. And Andrew Fuller, one of uh, William Carey's friends, said it was, as at, it was as if at that time that our group of brethren gave their word that whilst we lived, he said, we should never let go of the rope. It was, we are going to hold the rope. If you're going to go down, we're going to be here at home. We're going to be the church that supports you. We're going to be the church that prays for you. We're going to be the church that is behind you and the work that the Lord is calling you to do. And what God has called and called you to be, we are going to be behind you and we are going to support you in that. So what are some characteristics and some character traits of a missions-minded church? Well, the church at Antioch, they were a serving church. They had their focus on the Lord, and together as a church, they were serving the Lord and focused on Him. They were a seeking church. They fasted and prayed. Spirit-led, it was the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost that spoke to them, and they followed it. They were a sending church, willing to send them away, and they were a supporting church, a church that stayed behind them while they were on the field, a church that fellowshiped and brought them back and, and encouraged them while they were home and then sent them back out again, supporting the work and what they were doing. Oh, I pray that we at Coastal Baptist Church could be a church and would continue to be a church 
that would display the character traits and some of these character traits of being a missions-minded church. The importance of missions is what God has called us to be and called us to do as a church, as a group of individuals here. We're called to go into the world, to preach the gospel to every creature, to baptize them, to disciple them, and to see them grow in the things of the Lord, and then to continue to reproduce more disciples and more churches that will go forth and do the same. The importance of missions. We'll talk more next week on that subject and talk about some practical ways in which we can continue to be involved and to support missions. We'll go into that some more next week. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much again for the time together this evening. Lord, I do pray that you would continue to work in our church here, that we might be a missions-minded church, and that we might continue to press toward the goal of reaching those not only here, but around the world with the gospel seeing them come to a saving knowledge, seeing them follow you in believer's baptism, seeing them grow in the things of your word, being discipled and following after you. Lord, may we be a church that has a heart and that cares about missions. And it's in Jesus' name that I do pray. Amen. Amen. All right, give me a moment and we will take and go over our praise And prairie quest sheets.